several communities. It was based on communities, and they came and had tables, and I went around and was interviewing some of the people, and happened to come across Jason's booth, and uh, had a nice little talk with him, and, and the interview, and I said, well, you know what, we should get you up. Come up for History of High Noon sometime. So, due to the pandemic and all that kind of stuff, it kind of got delayed. So, today we have um, Jason Reed, who is the son of Jason R. Reed. I'm just going to read this just as you gave it to me. That kind of like that one. Grandson of, Jace, or of James G. Reed, great grandson of J.D. Reed, founder of the town of Brushy, South Dakota. Jason grew up and lives at the town site of Brushy, which is the Reed Ranch headquarters. Jason spent four years at SDSU and acquired a bachelor's degree in animal science with minors in ag, econ, range science, meat science, and aviation. He has since completed the South Dakota Ag and Rural, Leader, Rural Leadership Program and is now a current and active alums. Jason has ranched since 1981 and has weathered the 1980s interest rates, the blizzard of 2013, and who doesn't remember that, and many other challenges. In his management, the ranch has grown into a 16,000 acre cow calf operation that is currently being operated by his daughter and son in law. He has developed a pasture to plate program where he markets ranch raised beef locally. Throughout Jason's life, he has been a strong and vocal advocate not only for the Reed Ranch but also for Meade County and the state of South Dakota. He has served on the local school board on many legislative committees, nationally and state level. Meade County Farm Bureau President, founding and lifetime member of the South Dakota Grasslands Coalition, an active pilot for 30 years utilizing his own plane for work and pleasure and was the state representative to the 2012 Republican National Convention. In recent years, Jason has taken his talent for horsemanship, some learned, some inherited, to the next level, earning two National County Horse World Championships. He hopes to pass his knowledge of the rich history of brushing and horsemanship onto his three grandsons the reason I have a So welcome, Jason Reed. With an uh, introduction like that, I guess I'm not just going to do that on the kit. I'll tell you about those things. Uh, one thing about coming here today is fun to see so many familiar faces. I didn't, I know, didn't know that I'd know anybody in here. I think I know about half the people in here from one place or another. I guess that's me, Kelly. When I was asked to do this, or we talked about doing it, we were kind of centered on brushy because of the town, I could say community. But uh, in order to understand brushy, we have to go pre-brushy and post-brushy really to understand what happened. And when you understand a lot of the things that made some of these little communities, I don't care which one you pick up, like Zeal or Cooper or, or any of them, there are many of them out there. Uh, uh, the people made the community, of course, and their motivation is what made the community grow or go. Uh, in most cases. In uh, my great granddad's case, he was, uh, Brushy was a little bit earlier than most of these because his freight business established it and then the railroad coming to faith put it out of business. For most of the other communities, when the railroad came to faith, it was a quick and easy source to bring mail and supplies out to homesteaders. So a lot of the little communities, like Cooper, for instance, began after 1910. They used faith as a base and then spread out the way. So that's one little difference. But uh, the thing that made Brushy what it was was really my great granddad's natural instinct and desire to use horses to the level he did. When you go back to that era, everybody used horses and they used them a lot. There was two different uh, instances documented in the book where, or in different readings that I've got, uh, that documented so and so walked from Fort Perry to Brushy or rode a stagecoach in some cases to Brushy. But a lot of them used their own horses, their own teams, and their own wagons. 
because that was the mode of transportation, just like you would if you had a car today. Anyway, uh, I, don't, I could go back as far as when I both brought my great, 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 or whatever it was, granddad, uh, to the colonies. We've got it documented back that far. And through the Civil War, I've got to, I can't tell you how many generations back, uh, grandparent to sign the Declaration of Independence. So the history is deep and rich, and it, it just depends on what page we want to open up, because it's all very interesting and fun to study. But, uh, uh, Great granddad, or great great granddad, two generations of William Reed, uh, fought in the Civil War. And uh, each one of these times that I read, and I read and try to research it, uh, those gentlemen that fought in those wars, it doesn't matter whether it was, uh, well, it's a little different, but Civil War or World War I, uh, had a dramatic change on them, just like it does today, where we face that. We're so much more sensitive now to PTSD aware of it. But back then it changed those people and they had a different outlook on life and they behaved differently than they would have without the war experiences. So I wanted to make that note. Another note that I wanted to make was about this uh, kind of picked up. Well first of all I should say there's a reason we study history. Why are you here? Well one main reason is it's interesting and it's a hobby. And anybody can pick up any bit of history that's interesting and learn something from it. Uh, uh, a bigger reason might be to learn something out of it, to learn, because they say, and it's true, history kind of repeats itself, where people make the same mistakes over again, generations later or whatever. And so the study of our past tells us where we may be going or may not, should not be going, uh, so we can learn from it. But, uh, my interest in the history of Russia is 100% inherited. It's just because it's who I am. And I can't get away from it. I can't be anything else. It's just buried in the roots, which for me is a good thing. And I'm thankful for that. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to be able to share it today. So if at any time you want to interject or ask questions, this, this talk can go down that avenue that's most interesting since that's mostly what we're doing. So if anybody anytime wants to ask questions, if I get too long-winded and you have to go, get up and leave, that's okay. I got, like I said, a little while ago until it starts snowing. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so don't hesitate to visit afterwards or during it, during the conversation because there's uh, things that I'll forget to talk about that may be more interesting or I'll just skip over because there's a lot. Uh, I've got an awful lot of pictures. I've collected everything I could since I, well, since I was in grade school. <laughs> About, I make that reference because this is one of my teachers. Okay. Elementary teachers. We decide what year that was? It was I was a high, uh, excuse me, a high librarian. School I was the librarian in the elementary. Should I say what year? I don't know what year. Oh. Don't tell me. But About 74, oh. 75. Yeah. In that time frame. Right? Well, you were in high school then. Yeah. I think in the library in 74, 75, you taught me to enjoy history, brother. Oh, At least be quiet and sit still. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, lots of good memories. But don't hesitate to interrupt me. So, this, I've got a couple of really big weaknesses that he didn't mention in reading that. I don't think Susie put it on the bio. She wrote that bio for me and sent it in there to her. But she should have said that I have a terrible time remembering names and faces and people, and I can't remember dates. So it makes this history a little difficult. But I can't remember <laughs> people's or dates. So I could be quite a little off. I'm not infallible. And there, and in that, I want to say that the history that we have is not infallible. I find quite a few conflicting dates and conflicting ideas when I really get to study it and I want to do it right, you know, I want it to be the right date. And then I come up with two different dates, you know, for the same instance. And so, I don't know, it's only as good as what we lay out there, what we have, and so if I 
Say something that seems way out of whack, let's go back and research it and figure it out because I want to be accurate, I want to be right about it, but it's just kind of off the hip. Um, this is getting pretty long winded already, I haven't even started yet. Uh, this could take a long time. Uh, or it could be very, very quick. I've had people drive into the driveway and talk about asking a question, how long have you been here? And so it opens the door for me to say something about brushy and we talk a little bit and that can be just a five minute introduction to my history of brushy and that person can sell the feed he's selling or whatever he's doing and go on about his day. And so this talk could last five minutes if that's what it should. But on the other hand, I've got a daughter and she's 34 or something like that now. And so the last 30 years I've been telling her about it. So this talk can last five minutes or 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> However deep we want to get into it. So, uh, the picture that's up there now is, is uh, probably not relevant, probably not a picture that I should have even brought, because it's dated uh, 1916, and it's really after the Brushy era. It's when my great granddad came back to Brushy. So, I don't know why I put it up there first, it kind of sets the stage up for this in reverse. Um, but uh, I'll just leave it like that and take it down now so that we're not focused on it. The only advantage of seeing it was a description of a freight wagon. I'll put this one up here if I can. I'll just leave that one there. There's a lot of, because I don't want to run that thing very much, but I've got a lot of pictures and a lot of stories to back them up, and so this can go along. That's just an example, and I should have drew it down more because you can't see the lead team. Six horse hitch, yeah. The six horse hitch with a jerk line is what, is what made the town of Brushy. And then we'll get to that and I'll talk mostly about that. Uh, my great granddad, and I don't know how far I should go back here, but I'll start uh, in uh, the about 1870s. In about the 1870s, he was uh, in a little town on the frontier in Iowa. And he had the job as a young man, a young married man, of working on the water system. And he had four horses then, four big stout horses, that would wade into the river. And they would load the wagon with water. And he'd haul all the water up to the tower. And then they'd put the water in the water tower. And I'd never been able to research yet what they did with the water after it was in the tower. If the people came up there with a bucket and got it out of the tower, or, or if there was a pipeline in the homes. I don't know. But it was one of the first water systems in a little town in Iowa. And uh, he enjoyed his horses and he enjoyed doing that. And I don't know what the salary was like or, or what made him uh, nomadic enough to pull away from that. I've got a letter that talks about the, from the city dads saying, thank you, thank you for being here, thank you, we're sorry to see you go, kind of thing. Um, and most of all, we appreciate you leaving your teams and wagons. So he left his team wagon and, and moved west. <clears throat> he um, went into a little town south of Sioux Falls. Sioux Falls was uh, uh, a struggling new community too on the top of the river, on the Big Sioux River. And uh, just south of there is where he landed and began a quest to raise uh, Shorthorn or uh, uh, Durham, they were called then, Durham cattle. Uh, Longhorn cattle were Filling this country up, trailing cattle out of Texas. And another thing that we forget about sometimes when we start looking at this history is the monetary status of the society. There was no money. Uh, the country didn't have any money. The country had just what the Louisiana Territory, and there was no uh, income from a big chunk of land. Um, and, uh, the, I don't think there was any national debt, but there was no national reserve either. We'd come through World War I, World War II coming on, you know what I mean? And, and all of those things were hard on our national coffers. The reason that makes a difference is that influence out of, of the South and out of Texas, most of the money that came in the trail drives came from France. France funded a lot of cow herds and, and a lot of big cow outfits that grazed this country or money out of France that filled the Southerners, Texas, with cowboys pocketbooks and they put a herd together and brought cattle up across their head to Chicago in a big sweep. 
Anyway, those cattle were uh, long and tall and skinny. That's just how they were built, you know, and, and that's what the breed was. And uh, at some point in my great granddad's ideas, he decided that they could surely be improved and that the beef that was getting to Chicago didn't have to look like that. So there was an import of Durham cattle and he started breeding Durham cattle, which they in the United States called shorthorns. They called them shorthorns to, to differentiate from the longhorns because they wanted to know they were different. And they were. They're a lot musclier, a lot thicker, a lot uh, more docile. And then uh, the blizzard of 88, 1888, hit and killed all these cattle. He had a nice registered herd, one of the first registered herds in the upper wind of Mint uh, West. It wasn't uh, South Dakota then, it was the Dakota Territory. Mm -hmm. In the whole upper center of the nation, he had one of the first purebred herds of Durham cattle and took them all. Uh, and uh, I think they said that there was two or three cattle that survived the blood of the blizzard that died within a few months while he was trying to take care of them on pneumonia and stuff left over from the blizzard. And I suppose everybody here has seen the postcards. There's probably one here in the library. Uh, Charles Russell wrote, last of 10,000 of a, a steer that had been up here. I think it was a steer, a trail drive steer, and they were all gone, 10,000, same blizzard. Anyway, he vowed he would never own another cow in 1888, and he didn't. He just specialized in horses at that point. So his family was about half or eleven kids, and about half of them were born there, were born up at that, to that point. Uh, he went to working really for the government, not, not really working for them, but contracting for the cavalry. He developed some long, I could say long, six or eight horse uh, pack strings and rented them to the uh, cavalry and the cavalry was using them for communication between uh, Fort Pear, uh, Fort Meade, uh, Fort Clark at Bismarck. And there's two or three others that there's other references that they use these pack strings. But he would rent the strings out, and near as I can tell, an army officer would pick the strings up and help him pack them, and they would go whatever. So that was kind of the first of his uh, using horses to make a living. And the U.S. government was funding most of it with cavalry. He was involved a little bit with a few mule strings because the cavalry was also had uh, mule teams on each side of the Missouri River. So he moved in oh, during that period of time after that blizzard. He moved half his family. His wife stayed there for several years, back and forth a little bit. But they moved west. Uh, of course, at that time. Uh, Wounded he hadn't occurred yet, and, and so there was some Indian uprising issues, there were some things going on, and maybe, maybe that's why he left his family home, back there for a year or two. It took him a while for mom and the kids to migrate west with him. Uh, and I think uh, it was in 89 that my granddad was born, and so he was still raising kids when they weren't together. <laughs> However, that all happened. I missed it. It's just pretty poor records of that. And anyway, um, so while I was working on those uh, long pack strings and having a pretty good income by renting them or selling them to the, in some of these, to the cavalry, then he began the six horse hitch because of the hitches that were, he, he'd always driven hitches and big hitches, but then the jerk line hitch became more important to him because of the method of handling the horses. And uh, there's not very many people that know about a jerk line and have used them or seen them. Um, and so that tells me that it wasn't real common. There was a lot of freighting going on, but not very much with a jerk line. So that's what, this jerk line hitch is what anchored brushing. And it was just because my main friend had understood it, could use it, and he taught his kids how to use it. So, uh, I don't know the time frame or how the cavalry developed, matured, and, and needed or didn't need his teams, but
but it kind of graduated from the long strings of horses packing around the Louisiana Purchase or around the whole uh, Dakota Territory to the jerkline freighting business. And I have the copy here and I was going to put it up there, but I don't think it'll do any good of uh, when he was given his uh, post office in Brushy. He was hauling a lot of freight out here to the cattle people. By out here, I mean from here. I skipped a little bit there because I was going to tell you about his era for a year or two. He helped the cavalry work with mule teams on each side of the river. They would barge at Fort Pierre because Fort Pierre was the really only access to Fort Meade. And, and all the things that they needed at Fort Meade had to come from the east. So they come up the river, up the Missouri River, as far as the barge could go. And you have to visualize this river looking a lot different than it does now. Now it's covered with big dams. And so that little meandering river looked a little different. But the Corps of Engineers or the cavalry are together, built a mule trail, mule trail on both sides of the river. And they would come up as far as they could with a steam-powered boat and then uh, they would be turned into or loaded on barges and the barges would be pulled up the river the last way. So they tried to go as far as they could and then sometimes they could come all the way to Fort Pier. And that's really why Fort Pier was there because it was the furthest you could get a, a boat up the river reliable. But that wasn't reliable enough and that's where the mules came in. They would uh, hit some mules on each side of the river bank and tow a tug of military supplies to Fort Pier. So he could load it on his pack train and take it to Fort Meade or to Bismarck or Fort Robinson. So anyway, uh, he was pretty well located in Fort Pier and he got his family moved to Fort Pier and he was doing a lot of freight business to the south down past uh, Pedro and uh, on down to Smithville and Wasta as well as up toward Brushy. And then uh, being affiliated with the uh, government and the military like he was, he learned about the opportunity to get a contract defense of the uh, west side of the Cheyenne River Reservation. And I think it was in 19, uh, or 1889 or, eight, or 90 or both, they took on the contract and with uh, six sons, over 10 years old, started building 37 miles of fence out in the middle of grassland and in the middle of cow. Cowmen liked it. The cattlemen liked the rain, the old rain. The Indians liked the freedom they had. And all of a sudden there's this <laughs> barbed wire being stretched. First barbed wire in, uh, first barbed wire that was stretched in uh, According to the lore, I guess all this is disputable, but the first barbed wire that was stretched in Dakota Territory. The government furnished the wire and he had to cut ash posts, dig the holes by hand, and uh, stretch 37 miles of fence. And uh, that just furthered his opportunity to keep his freight wagons busy. Uh, they didn't talk about his daughters um, on that fence line in anything that I read, but his uh, two oldest daughters were really good teamsters and they spent their time on the wagons. And so the girls would haul freight back and forth to Fort Pierre. And it got so that they always had more to do with cattlemen and even with the Indians. They unloaded a lot of freight at uh, Cheyenne, at uh, Cherokee for the tribe for the Indians. And some of that was government supplied already, trying to keep the Indians content and at home and healthy and safe and so He got to be a uh, very, very good friend. There was a chief, uh, a white swan. A white swan was uh, uh, in the council with uh, uh, Setting Bull. It's just the white swan was a domestic, a domestic uh, the lives of the Indians domestically was his interest, more than fighting for territory. 
and that's why he wasn't killed and, like, uh, at our sentence. Anyway, he was a very good friend of my great great granddad, as well as uh, a lot of Native American people were. And uh, also, he was good friends with the cattlemen. There was times there where it was a little confrontational. They had uh, loaded shotguns in the wagon bed and pistols on their hips when they were building that fence. But as time grew on and they realized that it was good for the Indians and good for the cattlemen and they needed to do it, there was progress, it soon became that my great, great granddad and uh, his family were really, really good friends with both sides of the community. And they were the lifeline. They were bringing a lot of freight and a lot of food and a lot of mail. All the necessities that they needed. It, it's really hard to think about that community, the vastness of it, with nothing, with no roads, no oil, no power, uh, very little crops, just what, excuse me, just what they could raise. So, I don't know, no matter how much history I study of this, I don't know. And how enriched it is in my life, I still don't know if I'm going to ever know what it felt like to be there then, you know, and how, and how they really lived, you know. Uh, big families, but most of those uh, women uh, or families lost one or two kids. Often it says um, 11 out of 13 or something like that. Uh, there's a, same people having the same problems, but with no, none of the conveniences that we had. Anyway, I digress. I guess go back to what I was talking about. So, uh, the girls became mostly the teamsters early on when the boys were working on the fence line and then the boys joined in too as the, as the hitch and the, and the delivery of goods became more important to them and the contract with, uh, with the government wore out. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this gentleman over here had a question, Jason. Yes. yes. Could you pinpoint the location of brushing? Oh, that would be good. I had the map here. I might need some help with it up here. Let me see. So, this is 1889. So, there's no roads. It's filled with a lot of dreams because this is the map of statehood. So, uh, I, I, I believe that it was uh, drawn up um, to convince those in power that it was a viable community and, a, and, a, and productive. I think there's a lot of things on this map that, well, certainly aren't there today, and I don't know that they ever really were, such as the counties were just drawn in. Um, uh, Choke County, Delano, Scobie, all part of Meade County. And now, and I don't know if those, as far as I know, they ever had a county seat. I don't think they had a county sheriff. I don't think they had county structure. Somebody just threw them on the map. That, so when I see something like that, then that tends to make me wonder how much more is on this map that doesn't need to be there. But uh, it's pretty busy. So I'm not too close to see it. Um, so what is now northeastern Meade County? And that map isn't going to work very well for us. But this is Meade County now. So the <laughs> Malfoos River, the Cheyenne River, and Cherry Creek run into the river. Um, so meet, uh, Faith is about right there. And Brushy was 12 miles south, or it is 12 miles south of present day Faith. Does that help? Yep. Uh, if you had a thumbtack and a piece of string about so long that you put it in Fort Pier, it go the end would go past Brushy, and if you put it in Fort Clark, it would go past Brushy. If you put it in Fort Meade, it would Brushy. It's right out there in the middle, where the cavalry didn't get too very often. <laughs> so. Um, was it named after the sagebrush that was all around? Good, good question. The uh, uh, I was going to do that and didn't. Uh, I could look it up here, but I'm not going to. In my books and read to you. There's a name I can't not pronounce. It's W H U S H. It's in there. It's a Sioux Indian name that means 
thorny bushes. Uh, and, and it's the name of the trick. White men call it brushy. There's only bushes, uh, thorny bushes, you know. <laughs> Mostly, yeah. And then the next trick over, Cherry Creek, or what we call Suffolk Creek. Mm -hmm. it, on, on the reservation side, it's Cherry Creek. Yeah. And that was named after the truck cherries that grow on it by the Indians. That's, that's the name of the creek, is why it's called Rushy. And he was using the creek because not only was it covered with thorny brush, um, wild plum brushes, it had some big old ash trees. And they were using the ash trees on the fence line on the reservation. So if you can imagine taking a broad axe, of course they freight a stone and the original axis were appeared. But they <coughs> cut the ash poles with broad axe all over and dig the hole by hand, whatever that means. Well, if I meant by your hand, or if you had a coffee cup to dig with, I don't know what to have. So, from Fort Pier to Brushy is roughly how many miles? Um, straight across by the day, well, if I drive to Fort Pier today, I'd say it's 100 miles, and I'm about 100 miles to Sturgis. Yeah. Um, but the way they went, it was just about 80 miles. Okay. Through, through the reservation, through um, Cherry Creek Station, across the river, across the Cheyenne River, mm -hmm. and to Fort Pier. And uh, he had he tried to have a um, pair of freight wagons, a six horse hitch, leaving Brushy every day, and one coming in every day. That was the goal he had. Sometimes he had more than that, and I'm sure they missed some days. So how many days from Fort Pier then? <clears throat> they would camp together at Cherry Creek. By together, I mean he had one going and one coming. Sure. And so they would camp together. These kids would camp overnight together on one side or the other of uh, the Cheyenne River okay. by Cherokee. And at first they were always camping, it sounded like, on the south side of the river, away from the Indians. <laughs> but then as they got more and more uh, reliable and they sold a lot of goods to the Indians and things got safer, they would go right into the encampment and stay at Cherry Creek and then get up the next morning and go that way. So, you've all driven from uh, 34 to, uh, thank you for this whole time, uh, from on 34 to the pier. And the biggest obstacle we have if we're going to go to the pier today is crossing the Shannon River. When you get up on the other side, you can almost coast the pier. Same way if you're coming home, you get up on this side, you can just come in the stairs. So, you know what that river breaks were like? with this uh, six horse hitch. And wagons had to pull that hill, yeah. both sides. And uh, so that made that encampment that they had together. Whew, we're here, now yeah. we're gonna start fresh in the morning and get up the hill. Yeah. Yeah. One interesting little story. <clears throat> My uh, granddad, uh, I believe he was born in 89. And so, how would it be, how old would it be, about, uh, between 14 and six, 14 and 18 maybe years old, when he was driving one of these six horse hitches, one of these teams. He comes down the river hill to Cherry Creek, and uh, there was a whole bunch of people camped there, like a wagon train had stopped, people coming west, and the river was high, the water was high. And uh, he proceeded to tie his wagon boxes to the running gear so the boxes don't float away from the wheels. And he, they always had an outrider horse, I have that, that picture, but and he took the saddle off from his outrider horse that was tied on the back of the wagon and put it in the lead team because he knew how that horse could swim. And then he got on that horse and rode it. And let that, six horse hits you through the water and uh, that was a story that's been written up by quite a few people on that wagon train. They were so impressed that they were headed for Brushy. They stood there and talked to this kid long enough to know he was going to Brushy and he was frightened to Brushy and so then they knew where their destination was and so three or four days later they all came into Brushy telling, they were telling uh, this kid's dad about how much nerve that kid had putting that horse in that water. So, uh, you know, it takes quite a little just to understand, uh, you know, uh, 
I guess we've all had, probably all of us have had some experience with horses. But uh, to really get to the differences in what it takes to make a good team work together like that, I don't know if any of us can really understand that unless we did it every day. But I find it really, really interesting. I've enjoyed doing that. I've put four of those uh, six horse stitches together since then just to try to keep that alive. Um, two of them with my dad. My dad really instigated it and we put them together. And then um, I've done it twice since. And I might have the courage to do it again someday. So. Who's in this picture? <laughs> no, that's my uncle. The seven, uh, uh, I think that would be called seven sons out of, uh, eight, yeah, my great great granddad, J.B. Reed, and seven of his sons. At Brushy, both back at Brushy. Um, and I could name them for you if you'd like me to. Uh, they were all proficient horsemen. Two of them uh, ended up uh, forming the Foundation for the Rough Riders Museum in Miles City. Have you been to the museum in Miles City? We yeah. tried. But it was closed. Oh no, it should go there. And it's like any of the old museums. It's struggling financially. And it's struggling to have people take care of it, keep it open. But it is a very, very interesting museum. Uh, those two brothers with uh, four other people formed the Turtle Association. And the Turtle Association was named after a tree and a saddle that later became PRCA and the Bronc Rider Saddle. And so if, you, if you Google or however you do your research, look up Turtle Association, you'll find two of my great uncles who are founder, founding members of that association. The, uh, another one of them was the first uh, PRCA judge, rough stop judge. And he traveled all over the country with the uh, they gave him a pair of Angora shafts for judging the Calgary Stampede one time. I still got them. So that's a fun, fun history. Uh, anyway, we digress. We get off topic pretty easy. So if it interests you, I'll talk a little bit about what makes a six horse hitch different than, than any other hitch. Now, it probably doesn't matter, and probably never will matter to any of us again. However, it made the difference whether Brushy worked or not. And it was kind of the end because it wasn't necessary anymore. Everything could be done with two horses, with four lines to two horses to freight from uh, the end of the railroad at Faith to the little towns that were scattered around. Like Eusta, and what was that one we talked about? Bonetta Springs. Bonetta Springs. See, that's two sides of Faith. And they could have easily got there got their uh, stuff off the end of the railroad. It wasn't very long after that uh, railroad was coming out, uh, the Southern Railroad, different railroad company. Well, the railroad company that ended up at uh, Faith was the end of the line, run out of money and got beat actually, time frame by the railroad that came out, was in the Southern South Dakota and got into Rapid City and up to Denver. But the trouble there was, and the reason they were out there faster, was it was a narrow gauge track. Faster to lay, cheaper to lay, but it didn't last very long. They had to relay their track. Anyway, well, I hope you've all heard about the narrow gauge track if you've studied Leader Deadwood much. They used it more in the mountains than anywhere else. Anyway, I regret it. Got to get back to my topic. So, um, a jerk line team is handled. This is the last picture I have of my dad. Does that look like the Jane Good Union? He's, he's uh, he'll bring that down to size. But often we rode the left hand wheel horse. And the reason you ride the wheel horse is that that's your only brakes. You, there's no brakes on the back wagon. And on the front wagon, they had a, a rope on a lever that he could pull to, to set the brakes on the wheels on the front wagon. Um, but the horses stopped the load, held the load. And if you were sitting on that horse, you could check him up with a check line and reach over and grab the other horse and check him up. So that was the, the other four horses in the hitch. Uh, no break.
breaks, except Quo. They did learn uh, Quo and G and Ha. It was so fun to work with them horses when we had them trained so that they could just G and Ha them around. And they would, they would actually, in the hitch, all six of them would prick their ears and listen. And you could tell when they got unsure about what they should do, they just listen because they wanted you to reassure them. You know, I could talk to them and talk to them or G and Ha a little bit driving mostly with voices. But the jerk line comes off his uh, right hand there through each one of the, uh, a ring of each hand of each harness into the bit, far bit um, of the right, their left hand lead horse. If you notice how these horses, are, their heads are tucked in a little bit, they learned to travel that way because that was a free spot for their head and they're paying attention to where the next control was going to come from to move them around. Uh, we're training on them. I'm sitting here on this horse horseback as an outrider and 90% of the time there was an outrider with these teams. Very seldom did they did get that. Uh, your granddad had ever seen, send a teenage kid to appear without his brother or sister outriding with him. And a lot of times there was another saddle horse tied on the back. So, uh, just like if you was putting one together today, there's nothing more important when you have a team hitched than having an outrider with you. Um, so, anyway, there's, there's what they call a jockey stick that goes from the chest of the deer horse, I see the fingers, up to the bit of the far horse. So, if we could get the chest to move to the near horse, the far horse team, either way. If you get your lead team to go, the rest of the team pretty much has to follow them and they learn to follow them. So, with the jerk line, it's really misnamed. I, I, I don't know even why they call it a jerk line, because you never really jerk on it. You just keep it a little taut to offset some of that headset on that horse so it feels it, and then pull harder to bring his head to the left. Or flip slack at it to get him to go to the right. And uh, I think it's just like anything else a person would do. If you want to learn to play the piano, you spend some time learning how. And it's just as delicate, just as technical as anything you try to do to learn to drive a turn. But fun to do, and, and uh, it's what anchored brushy, and it's what sat it apart from a lot of it other communities. Had an ability to move freight with double wagons like that. And most of the time you see the freight wagons were bound to turn. I've got lots of pictures we can look at if you're more and more interested in it. The freight was serving the homesteaders or who was the freight serving? Well that was another thing that made the change. Uh, at first <coughs> he began serving the cavalry and he graduated to the cattle outfits. They served the cattle outfits for five to ten years and then as that switched uh, that's another reason to study the monetary changes in our country was if they couldn't get this ground on a tax base, they couldn't have a county, couldn't have a school. And so that's the biggest reason for uh, homesteading was to get a tax base. And so it, it gradually changed. That's a very good question. It migrated from through all of those things. Uh, Got uh, well. I wish I could pull this off the top of my head when the first homesteaders came, but that was just kind of a gradual number two, and, and to be disputed. My great great granddad, when he had the reservation, had to get what they called a uh, forest permit to harvest lumber in the Dakota Territory. Now I don't know what. I mean, he had one. Anyway. And it was on Brushy Creek. And with that came some occupation rights or some ties to the use of it. He never owned the land, but nobody else could come in and cut wood on his, and he put up a sawmill. And so, uh, how after the fencing was done, he had the logging. And, and that's another thing that made Brushy kind of work. It grew up all fast without that sawmill there cutting wood and making the boards two by fours and the, the building, buildings out of it. And, and 
and one of my sixes to cheat them with. It had been a, almost, they'd still be a sod chance. Because before that, and, and even after that, you couldn't afford to buy the lumber, you just built your sod house. You know. So, uh, let's see, I should talk about brushing a little bit, and I can't grab the paper right here, so I'm going to just go off the top of my head. Here, let's see if I have a uh, list of uh, businesses. Maybe I can, anyway. There was two post offices or two uh, two newspapers. So right away, Dan said, "Why in the world would you need two post offices, two newspapers?" The reason they had to have two newspapers was that everybody that homesteaded 160 acres had to be published and had to be published in a recorded paper and had to be published uh, enough times to be uh, legal. And I don't know what that was. Maybe it was different different times, but. Either they had to have it published when they staked it out, and then again when it was going to be certified. And so uh, the newspapers were very important, and each one of the two newspapers had a land office with it. And then each land office would have a surveyor working for them. So you would pull in there and you would go to the land office, and the surveyor would either, and you would go out and pick the spot you wanted, and the surveyor would go out and help you stake it, show you the corners. I have to question the accuracy of that. I'm going to chain across the country with no pins to start with. But anyway, uh, they uh, staked the corners and recorded in the newspaper that you'd done that and recorded again after you'd been in on the property long enough. But <clears throat> it's pretty confusing to study the Homestead Act because if you pick up the Homestead Act, there was an act in Congress, it was called the Homestead Act, but there was about four other acts that preceded the Homestead Act. So before the Homestead Act became uh, uh, useful, they tried several different other ways of dispersing this ground until they perfected it to the Homestead Act. So some of the squaw, and they were called, after the Homestead Act, they, they nicknamed all the people that had been on those properties beforehand, it, at least it looks to me like this in history, squatters. And you had squatters' rights. And that was actually, that was really a right. And, you know, the squatter right sounds like kind of a slang or a negative thing, but it really wasn't. It was an actual right to the real estate that nobody could homestead it because you were there first. And a lot of that came with force permits or just the time that you'd been there. And then you'd apply for squatter rights and you could go past all of the regulations of, of homestead because you'd been there a long enough period of time. So I've got some parcels that my great great uncles and aunts homesteaded. I've got seven different sites that were homesteaded by my relatives. My dad had five. I was able to purchase two more from neighbors since then. So I've got seven. So that makes me feel pretty good. Um, at Brushy's Peak, how many, what would be the population? Roughly, I mean. Well, uh, I don't know that Brushy ever had a city perimeter. Okay. So I don't know how big to make the community, okay. you know, sure. and the store owners. I know that there was 11 recorded businesses operating in town okay. on Main Street, so to speak. Uh, and maybe there was probably... That, yeah, it was documented as four or five fringe businesses that fed them. You know, like was the there a was school? The yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was the, one of the first things that my great grandson did. It. And it says that they put the school up in, in the history book so that his kids would have a place to go to school early on. And he hired a teacher, Margaret, from uh, Eastern South Dakota, and her name is documented there. But this is pre homestead days. Okay. Because then when they uh, got the land plotted out, and people came to Homestead, they made uh, Section 6 and Section 36 state lands. And they didn't allow anybody to homestead on Section 6. In every township, Section 6 and Section 36 was set aside for school land. And so that was how they were going to fund the schools and where they were going to put the schools. That's just our forefathers' uh, big view, if you want to know what it is. So yeah. then when homesteaders got uh, moving, this school actually 
Well, they hired a teacher for what they call the Russian Creek School, which was four miles away, to get on Section 36. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so that's sense. Yeah. And so the kids, the older kids then, uh, from, I'm going to say, 06 on, yeah. went to the schoolhouse four miles away. Really fun stories about the school kids, and because the, the, uh, oh, they were an age where they could relate it to the generation that I could get it from. So let's hear some fun stories about uh, school age and going back and forth to the schoolhouse. Uh, that two-story, whitish, light colored. Yeah, with the false front. Oh, that's a yeah. false front. Yeah. Okay. yeah, it's a big false front. The roof, you can just see the corner of it back there. <laughs> Uh, it, says it, sure. uh, it says it has a dance hall upstairs yep. and the land office below. Land and printing office below, dance hall above. Yeah, and this is one of those things. Yeah. Maybe that was that way or not. The dance hall part is sure true. Because, uh, there was a lady that was about 100 years old, Lucy Doe. Maybe some of you remember Lucy Doe? Yeah. I, I had a wonderful opportunity to visit her personally, and she told me about the opportunity she had as a little girl to get in the wagon with her parents, her parents would bring her to the dances at Brushy, and she would sit in the eve, she called it the eve, oh. on the back of the dance floor watching her parents dance. Mm -hmm. And then her dad would go to the pot belly stove that they had and get a break, they put, they put rocks in the stove, and they'd fish a rock out, hot rock, and put it in a horse hide blanket, horse hide robe. Mm -hmm put it on the bottom of the wagon box and she'd roll up in it to get home. And she remembered rolling up by the hot rock in order to stay warm enough to get home on the yeah. night after the dance. Lucy Doak, I think she was one of the oldest living South Dakotans when she passed away at 102 or 104 or something. Uh, fish anyway. yeah. Okay, looking, looking at that picture, where is your home? Is it in the picture, like right there? What direction is that? East. Is there? So, if you want to go in for that answer that question, okay. I'm going to invite each one of you to come see me someday. Because you can get your foot on the ground and feel where it is, and it feels quite a little different than this. So, that's my number one challenge. Everybody come see me sometime. Call or don't, I don't care. Just come see me. <laughs> uh, the second challenge is if you find this interesting, and enjoyable. Do what you can to help me oh, preserve it. Yeah, we can even pass that around if it helps. But this is the same picture made. Anyway, uh, behind the log house, where the log house is not just behind it, in 1927, mm -hmm. they built the house that, I, that we live in mm -hmm. out of these buildings. Oh, neat. They pulled them together and built the house that we live in today. I remodeled it. <laughs> it's still not the same now. So anything left of the log house? No, no, it hasn't been all my lifetime. I've never seen it or anything. It, it was completely uh, taken down. There was another log house that one of my uncles lived in. It was just up the creek that I can remember playing in as a little kid. Big cottonwood logs. It was made out of huge logs. Wow. And uh, it stood uh, probably into the 70s before those cottonwood logs were rotted. Yeah, yeah. it couldn't be preserved anymore. A cemetery. Yeah, um, there's two cemeteries, um, one east of the place and one west of the place. The one that east of the place was, for some reason, not very uh, talked about or shared about. Mm -hmm. And then the town of Cooper uh, inherited the one that was just west of us. Okay. It's called the Cooper Cemetery. If you need to go, just go. So, um, let's see, what was I going to talk about about the buildings here just a little bit? So, I, from this picture, in order to take this picture, you probably had to be in the near the creek, in the creek, or sitting in a tree in the creek. I don't know how they got it, because this is the creek meanders through here. Okay. And on the other side of the creek was, was another street with another row of buildings. And that's where the second paper office was. Question? Yeah. Is that meaningful? Uh, it was touched up. You mean hands cut up? Yeah. Yeah. Fake news? Um, kind of. Yeah, it wasn't a black and white picture in your hand. 
in any way. Uh, it was uh, touched up, and I'm going to quote this. I think at one time, anyway, it was one of the photos of my dad had of Brushy. Francis Nesma got it and had it taken to an artist and had it touched up. Oh, this, is that the painting? Had it colored. Is that a touch up? Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of history in that, too. And on the other side is the original watch. The stories of that. <clears throat> Let's see, what can we talk more about it? Um, this here is a hand dug well. Oh. The, the, the one guy standing on the frame of the well. And uh, the reason I pointed that out is that uh, just like it is right now about the problems we have water, it was a very important item. The neat thing about Brushy, or one of the reasons that Brushy uh, was formed, uh, is that the creek runs, um, you can't call it live all the time, mm -hmm. 10 months out of the year, mm -hmm. in, from January 15th to February 15th, it's froze up solid. Mm -hmm. And uh, then right after that, it starts uh, springing out and running out of the ice again. But um, then generally it goes dry late in August for two or three weeks. And then it starts back up again. So it's a spring-fed creek that is generally live. What year would that picture be? What's that? What year would 1905. Four or five, yeah. That's what it's called. That's over there, yeah. So is, got is that the well that you use now? No. That, that well would have been dug with a spade or a okay. shovel of some kind or buckets by two or three men going down into it shovel. and lifting the wood out, lifting the dirt out. Okay. And piling it on the side. That, uh, and so digging a well was quite a project. Yes. And every homestead had to have a well on it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard all these stories, but we have passed them out a lot of times. But they did different things to get our homestead proved up. They had to have a well. Well, one of the things that they did is carefully dig the well at the corner of the property. Mm -hmm. And then if they could get the right surveyor to cooperate with them, a the bottle of whiskey or whatever it took, that could serve four homesteads. Sure. If we could the twist the line just a little. Yeah. yeah, and so a lot of times a pair of brothers would have one homestead, one or two homesteads and a well, you know. And uh, so uh, the government officials that were out approving those things uh, were very willing to work with people because their goal was to get it in the tax base. Mm -hmm. It wasn't to be a estoppel to make it not happen. So they worked hard enough to get a well, even if it was your sister's well or whatever, you know. They pulled up. Uh, she doesn't give you your homestead. I remember going out to the house. Yeah. And I remember Ross's brother kind of saying, don't drink water. Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> Must have been 70s or mm -hmm. whatever. Are you still on that same well? No. From the 70s? No. no. Okay. No, but it's not a lot different. We did dig a little deeper and it's got it, the water at that layer and I can't say what formation we're into, mm -hmm. but it's got some, by the time it sets in the well, in the, in the case of the well, and we get it pumped into the house, it's got a little alkali, yeah. a little soda taste to it, yeah. but we, nowadays we've just got a real good filter system. That sure. We've got really good water, well, it's just like bottom water, you know, because sure. it's covered off the filter system. Yeah. And, um, I think uh, they have to. People have had to be a lot tougher. Than, oh yeah, oh yeah. You know, they didn't care if there was a little bit of grime on top of it, or if there were specks in the tea glass or whatever. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Dan. It was that or drink out of the creek. Go without. Yeah. Yeah. Go with hands without. and knees and bury your face and try to get out in the creek far enough that you could push the moss of the polylands back or whatever if you get a step out of it. <laughs> That's kind of how we grew up as kids. A lot of times I'd back out of a water hole just for the cows in the nest. Yeah. What was your mom's maiden name? I got to get the water. Um, Robbins was her. Um... Can I get you some more water? No, I'm all right. I just got to say one thank you, though.
McCabe was her birth maiden name, and Carl McCabe passed away to a ruptured appendicitis oh. at 30 some years old when he's had two little girls. And uh, uh, that same year that my mother's real dad passed away, her mother lost a pair of twin boys. So there would have been four in the family, but there was just two girls that were broke this well. Anyway, they were working for, uh, when this appendicitis occurred, they were working on a ranch on the Moral River. And uh, also on this ranch was where a man named Slim Robbins was working. And in time, Slim and my grandmother got married. And so my mother's maiden name now is Robbins, but she was born in Carl McCabe. Okay. Okay. Let's see, um, but that's, you see, a generation later than what we're, we're trying to talk about. It's not so hard for me to keep track of them, because my mom can talk to me. Is yes, she now. With us? Oh, yeah, she lives right outside of town. Yeah. yeah, and I can stop in and visit with her about it. Most days, she's just sharp as can be. She can remember things, and she'll tell me things that she wouldn't tell me then. <laughs> Well, I, I want to share that with you too, because it's just something that's clicked in my head the last probably five or ten years. And that is, I think I mentioned it to somebody here before we got started. When we, I got a lot of history. Anything anybody wrote in this, in any one of these books, was what they wanted to have remembered. But the negative things, the tough times, the bad things, aren't really recorded. There's a lot of deaths that weren't recorded that people just heard about, just heard, and didn't share or read from, you know, and a lot of other negative things. Uh, Marguerite Cleveland did a very good job of recording some of the uh, violent things that happened in early North County. There was a murder out there at Brushy that I never knew anything about until I until Marguerite, or Marguerite, mm -hmm. and Marguerite and yeah, Cleveland shared it with me. And then later she sent me write-ups where she researched it. And they had put a trial here in Sturgis by then. But it had to be pretty serious to come to trial. There's no sheriffs out there. And they handled most everything locally. locally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what does that mean? Yeah. Well, that's a good point. Yeah, what does that mean? <laughs> well, that's what they said about my great-great-granddad. See, he was postmaster, the founder of the town. But he was also an uh, entrepreneur and he gave you the right to be in town or to not be in town or, or carry a gun or, or whatever. He's also a policeman and an ambulance and, and you know, caretakers. And, you know, and the only source of food was my grandma's kitchen. So they had a cafe, if you will. It was just an open order. Meals anytime. Yeah, a lot of the write-ups from other homesteaders talked about uh, being able to go into the log house itself or to this other uh, building. Well, I lost the picture, but the first building is off to the left as you look at it. To your left in that picture it was called a bunkhouse and it had a dining hall in it and sleeping rooms. It was just kind of open for anybody for a new settler that came to town. You could bunk in the bunkhouse. And you got your wagon thing down enough to sleep in it or whatever you had to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does anybody have any more questions? More what's, questions? What's the pictures up there that you're wanting that? That's the gym we're talking about. That's my great 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 okay. dad. His, and another issue about that, uh, my dad always called her O'Reilly, Margaret O'Reilly, the Irish girl, Irish lady. But never did I see it O'Reilly, she's Riley, but they called her O'Reilly, or my dad did. Well, make sure that the issue is Irish, and there's some stories about her being Irish. Oh, so I wanted to talk about that too. How much time do I got? Well, anybody that, I mean, we generally say till one, but anybody that wants to leave can leave. Anybody that wants to stay can stay, and we'll just keep listening. You keep telling stories. You won't stories. offend me if you've got to get up and go. No, no. Absolutely no. won't. Um, so, uh, let's see, what was I going to call that? I have a story. Irish. Yeah. Uh, so, 
before, in the early parts of Russia, Russia's post office didn't get the final bill too. So there was a couple of years there that they had mostly their uh, logging rights and they had made some money, um, livelihood, for their family off of cutting trees. And uh, my dad would have been a youngster, maybe 10, 11 years old. And they were, uh, they heard some noises down the creek a ways. And so they, our uh, granddad wasn't home, so Margaret, my good grandma, thinks, the little boy Jimmy, my dad. Oh, yeah, yeah, excuse me, my granddad, right down the creek to investigate this noise. And then these people moved in there with their wagons and they're chopping trees on that property. And so she, she's pretty, she can get pretty riled up. And her Irish temper got to, got to her and she's cussing these guys out to them, get out of here, you know. This ain't your, you can't cut trees here. Go well, somewhere else and cut trees. And uh, I don't know, the language that she used was never quoted to me. But they had to cross the creek, jump the creek and go get on their wagons and leave. And as they were doing that, my granddad, the story goes, picks up the axe and it's pretty big for his little bit and he throws it and lands right in the creek. As he does it, he says, take your damn axe. <laughs> and throw it and land right in the creek. <laughs> that was a story that got back to me about the colorful language that she shared with her kids. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, uh, let's see. Um, I could go on and on on a lot of things. Go so on. this is the woman that stayed in Fort Pier with the children? For a while, until they got big enough. To yeah, okay, up. just connecting the and, picture and to I the story. And I think she was pregnant, you see. It's uh -huh. my opinion that she was pregnant, pregnant with that with a new baby. Each one of those two moves out here, she was probably having the next kid. Right. <clears throat> This book is not, but I can make it available in time. You can sure look at this one and I'll get more copies of this one. This is kind of a fun book. This one was written from, maybe many of you might have known, Opal Burton was um, my dad's sister and Darlene Stovall was another sister. And Johnny. Anyway, those two ladies have had this book printed, it's probably been 10 years ago now, and it's a collection of all those stories. And it's a pretty neat resource of the reads, and it's, it's the best resource we have. Yeah. Um, for sure. And we have 13 children. 13 children. This couple, well, 13 children by this couple. Yeah. 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 Um, nine, nine sons and three daughters. And I was, one of them was my granddad. Did all the children survive? Um, uh, 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 <laughs> no, I think one died in Yeah, there was at least one little girl passed away. Let me think about that. I'd have to research that a little more. Uh, there was one son that uh, was killed as a youngster. And it's one of those uh, school stories. He was uh, wagging around over him. He jumped out of the wagon box at school and the wagon ran over him. Died of his injuries. Anyway. Jason? Yes. I was telling Dwayne and Diana the other day that when I was a little girl I knew Elsie. So where does she fit into the picture? Um, Elsie married Fritz Judson. But was she your and dad's aunt? This is my dad's sister. Your dad's sister. My dad's okay. Sister. I was thinking maybe she was your great aunt, but she's no, your aunt. She's my dad's sister. Yeah, we can easily relate to this generation. It was my dad's generation, you know. But we go back to that next one. It's it's, it's a lot tougher. And that's why I get tangled up. So is she one of the younger ones? Yeah, Elsie was the youngest. No, 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 no. That's not right. Darlene was the youngest. Elsie was. Okay, yeah, all right. She wasn't the youngest. Okay, I was thinking maybe she was part of the family that hauled freight, but she was the next generation now. Right? Yeah. Your dad's generation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah she's the next generation. Yeah, next generation. Yeah. yeah. And did you knew her daughter, uh, Wanderay? Yes. Yeah. And Billy. And Billy. 
Because they came up to Trail Creek and lived for several years. Yeah. And 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 we were neighbors. Mm -hmm. oh, and yeah. so that is how I knew Elsie. Never knew she was Reed though oh, until yeah. we got to reading up on the town. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of. Uh, reasons for those kinds of things and some of that history that you're alluding to there and we could dig into deeper some of that is not very pretty some of it was avoided you know maybe she didn't use her last name as a little girl because she wasn't very proud of it at that time in her life that's just facts of life that's the way things work uh, and then uh, she passed away relatively early didn't get to see her i don't think wanda ray was married when elsie passed away i don't think mm -hmm. And I think she passed away with cancer, didn't she? Yes. Yeah. In Rapid City. Yeah. yeah. I remember seeing them once after they moved to Rapid City, but not long. And uh, Wanda Ray married Carl Nascar to follow this through. And Carl Nascar trained on Bridal and three other uh, Finnish in horses in the Kentucky Derby. So the horsemanship took a different angle there, but Wanda took it that way. Wanda was also Derby. Miss Indian yeah. America one year, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One that was Miss Indian America one year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. This is the next generation is Jimmy, or James G. And then you got right here. That's my grandpa, my great grandpa. Your grandpa. And this is your dad. Jim Long. This is Jimmy Reed. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, is that right? Are you sure you're not a yeah. generation? Yeah. Okay. It's Jimmy. That's Jimmy when he was little. James and Jimmy. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, is there any other thing I can be more descriptive about or talk about at an angle? Uh, I could talk a little before. Go ahead. Just to comment on, on the research that you've done and so forth. It's interesting what you find about your ancestors mm -hmm. when you start digging. Uh, we, we, my some cousins, have done research on my dad's side of the family. We find out that my grandfather and grandmother uh, were kind of kicked out of her family down in Iowa because she was another man's wife. Oh, well. Wow. Um, things like that is what I was alluding to that we, they get yeah. knocked under the table and the kids don't get to hear about that. No. Yeah. yeah. Kids, it isn't a story that we sent around it, history. It took some digging to find it. That's right. Yeah. It was there. <laughs> yeah. One story that I have kind of like that is that um, my great uncle Grover was in uh, World War I. And nobody told me until very recently that when he came back from World War I, he was a different guy than he went in. And uh, at this time, uh, uh, not only were the Indians put on the reservation, but it was uh, prohibition. No alcohol allowed on the reservation, no alcohol for sale anywhere. But uh, Grover homesteaded, and in the corner of his homestead was Grover's Grove. And in Grover's Grove, in the center of the Grove trees, he had a still. He had a well and, and two other holes in the ground where he kept his some of his goods cold and some of them hot. Because he was making whiskey. Yeah. Grover's Grove. And people would come a long, long ways to Grover's Grove <laughs> to his whiskey. That little patch of barley that he made. Malt liquor out of it. And that that isn't written up in any of these books. Yeah. You won't find that. Yeah. Grover's Grove. Yeah. Yes. That's some really interesting stuff though. Yeah. Well, another thing, a point I'd like to make, not to worry y'all, but the change in society, or social changes. Uh, when I was a little boy, I can remember if I heard two, especially adults, getting introduced for the first time, one of them would say, well, what nationality are you? Are you Swede or are you Irish? Nowadays, nobody's asking that question. We're all just in the melting pot. We're all part of all of it. And to me, uh, I see the growth in a social group or a society in a real positive way. Because if we could get past calling the Swedes Swedes or or Irish or having whatever animosities we had toward those different clans or groups, if you will, we can get past the things that are socially driving us apart now. 
Right. Yeah. And in time we would. So that was one of those things that I think that we can learn from history is that some of the good things we do so we as a society will go past some of the animosities that we have toward uh, race and gender in time. Immigrants. Hmm? Yeah. 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 Jason, one of the things that you mentioned that the 16 inch is what made him rushing. Mm -hmm. Was that because you could pull two wagons with the six, or was it making the hills, or? Well, it's all of that. Absolutely all. it's that. Yeah, the two, the two wagons is very important. But the other part is that it was a light and easy enough handle that the, the breaking job, if you will, or training job on that team was good enough that these teenage kids could safely do it. Good manage sure. Young people could handle it. They weren't having runaways, they weren't having problems. Uh, in all the history that I've read about, now this isn't true for my dad, but going back a generation or two, I've never heard about a horse wreck. I've seen some pictures of some horses tied down that they were getting on. They were blindfolded and they were had feet tied together and their saddles on and they're getting on for the first time. And things get a little wild, a little western. But from a hitching standpoint, there's not a lot of talk about uh, uh, horses running off but, and wagon wrecks and people getting killed with wagon wrecks and stuff like that. So that, uh, it's my opinion, at least, that these horses were very well trained and very well, and behaved very well. And they were used, like you said, daily, daily. daily. and that was what they did, yeah. and now, People get on their horse infrequently, maybe. I got on mine at six o'clock this morning. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> the house worked on the town. Yeah. But you're right. That that is yeah. exactly right. And so now, as we've grown past that time of using the horse, we've lost the connection with what it took to make that horse usable. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I wanted to maintain and pass on a little bit. I mean, bit you were now. talking about the horses waiting to hear. Yeah. Man. yeah, that's a phenomenon that most people won't get to enjoy. And and that is only acquired if you work that horse daily. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And another thing to think about along those lines uh, is that if he had uh, six or eight of these hitches, mm -hmm. uh, two to four on the road all the time. Right. Uh, times six, six times six is 36, plus an outrider horse yeah. with each one. So he has about 50 horses out on the road. Oh, yeah. Now to support the horses that are out on the road, what does the remuda look like? What does the string at home look like? Yeah, the substitutes. Yeah, absolutely. It was always a lame one, you know, or one that needed this or that, or broke or trained or worked yeah. with, you know, and a monos to those uh, good horses that he had. So uh, the mare band, uh, I've got one documentation where they had over 500 mares, another one that they had 300 mares. Yeah. And one of their big uh, incomes was sell, selling horses to the cavalry all along. And so most of the horses that he used were the ones that didn't get sold to cavalry, I think. Well, and you think about the stagecoaches that all of the people mm -hmm. were always changing teams how frequently. Yep. And yeah, you had to have a bunch. Yeah, it took a lot of horses. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Jason, thank you so much. Let's give a round of applause. <laughs> thank you, Susie, for helping. It was very nice to have you both. Great program. And on behalf of Sturgis Arts Council, here's a little gift for you. Well, thank you. You bet. Appreciate it. Yeah. Wonderful program. Very happy that you all came. Uh, I have a stack of uh, postcards that I didn't get to talk about very much, but these are a copy of an actual postcard that was mailed at Brushy. If ever, anybody wants one of these old postcards, just pick one up with take ownership, pass them over. I'll just set them here. If you, if you want a postcard from Brushy, these aren't postmarked. That's all right. But I have. I used to be the postmaster at Vail if I still had my hand cans where I could catch up with the I have one or two. Let's see. No, I have four. I actually have four pieces of mail that were stamped with Russian. And I've got, uh, oh, I should share this a little bit. 
Uh, I'm looking for these, so I'm going to ask every one of these, every one of you to go out and find me one of these cups. These were Christmas presents that my, or during the holiday season, my great great granddad would hand out at the store to Brushy Creek store. And I don't know. Is it a Courier and Ives print? Is it like Courier and Ives? No, it's a, it's a print of the town, of, 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 of his business. Right on the plate. Oh, but a treasure. I don't even want to hold it. Mm -hmm. I don't want to drop it. <laughs> <laughs> this one I did drop. No, somebody did. It's got the handle broke okay. off a teacup. So, oh, yeah. Horse the quest is, is go find me one of them, wherever it is. Is there some of them out there? Well, some of us do rummage around the antique stores and the second hand stores, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Most of them say brushy off. Pioneer days, brushy something.